Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, first, um, let me introduce Professor Michael Johnson. It's our pleasure to invite uh, Professor Mark Johnson to give a talk this afternoon. Uh, Mark got his uh, bachelor degree from Sydney University, where he wrote his uh, owner thesis on computational statistical mechanics. Then he changed topics to computation uh, to linguistics uh, because he wanted to do something more creative. He did a master's degree at uh, UC San Diego and also a PhD at uh, Stanford. Now he's a professor at Brown University, uh, the Department of Cognitive, Cognitive and Linguistic Sciences, and also Computer Science. Mm -hmm. um, he was the president of ACL 2003. Uh, he will stay at Microsoft Research until August. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Yes. Uh, in fact, one of the things which I think is sort of amusing is that uh, when I was doing my uh, undergraduate thesis on the uh, uh, statistical uh, mechanical model of uh, the gas-liquid phase interface, I was extremely worried about calculating partition functions and things like that. And, uh, you know, these days, what am I doing but uh, calculating partition functions and things like that? So, all right. Uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, there's sort of two ways of, of spinning the talk today. One way is to sort of say, really, I'm involved in trying to do something, uh, an instance of good old-fashioned AI, right? Uh, what I'd really like to do is to develop a grammar learning algorithm that trains from unsegmented, broad phonemic input. In other words, takes a whole lot of sentences like dogs chase cats where there's not even it's word not boundaries. No, well, so I actually put that up because I figured I was talking to a bunch of computer scientists and they probably couldn't read the IPA notation, right? right. Uh, you know, and then actually produces as output, uh, you know, uh, output like that pass tree down at the bottom down there, which indicates that, uh, you know, dogs is a word that consists of a noun stem followed by a noun suffix. So, in other words, it contains a syntactic analysis and a morphological analysis and a morphological classification. So, I haven't done that yet, but you could, one, one way of sort of understanding today's talk is to say that it's a step in that direction. Another way of understanding today's talk is to say that if you take the most straightforward methods for trying to do unsupervised or semi-supervised induction, things like expectation maximization, instances of maximum likelihood, they generally produce very poor results. And recently, a, a number of uh, uh, new techniques known as non-parametric Bayesian methods based on Chinese restaurant processes and Dirichlet processes have sort of hit the stage. So you could sort of say today's talk is really asking the question, will these, will these new methods do any better? And so I want to show you how to try and apply these methods. And so from this perspective, today's talk is really just an instance of looking underneath of a light post. And the lamp post is a new lamp post that, of uh, these uh, Chinese restaurant processes. And the question is, can we do anything interesting with them? And the basic strategy is actually going to be try and see if we can develop methods that will actually work for very simple problems and see if we can generalize them. And the two simple problems I'll be talking about are morphological segmentation, basically breaking up verbs into stems plus suffixes, and then word segmentation, taking an unsegmented, uh, unsegmented phonemic transcript and breaking it into words. Um, and uh, I, I told you that the most straightforward methods really don't work terribly well, so I just want to give you some idea of what those methods are, because we'll be taking those methods and, and elaborating them. And uh, uh, I'm going to introduce you now to probabilistic context-free grammars. If you've been coming to my talks in the machine learning reading group, you've already been seeing these things over and over again. But, you know, basically the idea behind a probabilistic, yeah. I just want to stop you on the, it doesn't work very well, because I've been hearing for years and years that parsers work. So this is unsupervised induction of grammars. You'll actually, so, so I'll actually be going through exactly that by what I mean by saying that it doesn't 
work at least as well as what so we might want the, them to. The stuff that does work is supervised. Yes. Unsupervised. Yes. Okay. Yes. So anyway, so okay, this is a what we have up up above here is a probabilistic context-free grammar. In other words, it's a context-free grammar where each production is associated with a a, a probability. And so essentially this probability here is the probability of choosing this particular way of expanding a noun phrase as against this way over here. And the probability of a tree is just simply the product of the probabilities of all the productions that are needed to build that tree. So this tree here, for example, uses this production up here. The S says that this says a sentence consists of a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase, as this, this little tree here shows. The noun phrase expands to George. The verb phrase expands to bark. And if you multiply together the probabilities of all of those rules, you should get the probability for the tree, which, if I've done my calculation correctly, is 0.45. OK, so uh, backing off a little bit, uh, you, you can actually say that what I'd really like to be able to do is not just simply learn the weights on these uh, PCFGs, the weights on the productions, but actually learn the productions or the rules themselves. Unfortunately, that's extremely hard. Basically, the only thing that we can do at all well is to really estimate the production probabilities. In other words, given a fixed set of productions. And the expectation maximization algorithm is the name of an algorithm that actually does, at least it locally maximizes the likelihood. Uh, so well, certainly better than nothing at all. Um, and so in general, when people do need to try and actually learn the grammar, do more than just simply learning the, the, the production weights, the, the general method really is to use a sort of like a generate and prune approach. In other words, somehow generate a large number of possible productions, use something like expectation maximization to estimate the probability of each production, and then prune the low probability productions. And I actually think one way of understanding these non-parametric Bayesian techniques I'll be talking about today is that they integrate production search with parameter search. So to the extent, in other words, you, we, can get a, we can start to get away from this sort of generate and prune approach to learning structure. OK, so I told you that there are some problems with the standard approach list to sort of see what those problems look like. On, on the face of it, the fact that we've got something like expectation maximization, you know, the first time I heard about it, I thought, this is great. Our problem is solved. So the, the algorithms are, in fact, actually robust enough that they can be applied to sizable amounts of data. And so I want to show you something which is actually just applying expectation maximization to a fairly small amount of data. I did this about 10 years ago now, and, uh, when everybody else was also doing this as well. It probably would be time to try it again on a much larger data set. This is a data set uh, that contains about uh, 1,300 sentences, each of which has been hand parsed. Um, and so this is an example of a, of a parse tree for the sentence, show me all the non-stop flights from Dallas to Denver in the early in the morning. And you need about 1,000 PCFG rules to build all the trees that you see in this data set. So what we can do is we can just pretend that uh, we're just simply given the, the strings as training data, feed those into the expectation maximization algorithm, and actually see whether it can learn something which approximates these trees. And so that's basically what I'm going to do here. So I told you that the expectation maximization algorithm works by trying to find a local maximum of the probabilities of the trees, or sorry, of the productions, but make the grammar make the string as like, the grammar is tuned to make the, uh, the strings as likely as possible. And if we look at the probabilities of the strings, um, over the iterations of this algorithm, we can actually see the probability is systematically rising. So the expectation maximization algorithm is in fact actually working as advertised. It's systematically altering the rule probabilities to make the strings more and more likely. Unfortunately, when we measure the accuracy of the parses, and this is actually what I meant when I said that they don't... Well, Mariano had the same result uh, for speech tagging 10 years earlier. Sure. No, no, I agree. I agree. No, I mean, this is nothing new. And as I said, as I said, this is... organizing systems find a local minima that's uh, absolutely awful. So, so, so what I'm showing here is that basically, as I said, I did all this stuff 10 years ago. It probably would be wise to redo it on a larger data set now that we can do. But, but I actually doubt if the results would differ, right? I mean, what we're seeing here is that 
over, over these same iterations, as likelihood was rising, precision and recall are in fact actually falling, right? Accuracy of the passes is dropping. So what does this show, right? What this actually shows is that parse accuracy drops as likelihood is increasing. In other words, what it's actually showing is that higher likelihood does not lead to better parses, which really means that there's something very wrong in the statistical model. And in fact, what I didn't tell you is how I initialized this thing. In fact, actually, I initialized it with the correct parse trees. I actually, I actually started with the true rules and I estimated their probabilities from that tree bank since I knew what they were. So the poor performance was not due to search error. It's not getting trapped in a local minimum. I actually tracked, actually started it where I wanted it to finish, right? And I evaluated on the training data. So the poor performance is not due to overlearning either, right? So really, this is the only conclusion, <laughs> right? OK? So higher likelihood does not lead to improved parse accuracy, which really means that the probabilistic model and or the estimation procedure are the wrong thing. Uh, I can tell you, I'll, I'll be talking about Bayesian priors that can prefer smaller grammars. I can actually tell you that I've tried that and that doesn't seem to help here. There's a whole literature about what could be wrong and people have, you know, different people have diagnosed different types of things that could be wrong with this standard approach. Uh, I'm actually sort of particularly uh, you know, attracted to Zettelmeyer and Collins' idea that basically the grant, I mean, it really is sort of saying that predicting word strings is the wrong objective, that you should really be thinking about grammar as being a transduction between form and meaning, and that when you're trying to learn a grammar, you're really trying to learn that transduction. You're not just trying to make the strings more likely as possible. But, so, uh, yeah. So, I mean, that, that kind of uh, seems to be what it is, right? Because, I mean, when you're doing EM, you're maximizing the likelihood. Right. And what you're measuring is the precision and recall. Right. Right. No, 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 no I, I, I... No. I mean, so, so to do... A, yeah, I mean, I said, I think right. maximizing the likelihood of the strings is not the right objective, that we really want something which is... That, that if a grammar is really about mapping between form and meaning, that meaning or context or something should enter in there. Yes? So, in the graph, uh, you show to us... Is that on the test set or the training set? It's, well, the test set and the training set are the same. Oh, training set and test set are the same? Yeah, yeah. So it's not a case of overfitting on the training set. I mean, even if they are the same. If you start from random initialization, will your No, you start from the right answer. But I started from the right answer. Yeah, if you start from random initialization, it does get better. And in fact, actually... And in fact, there's, there's, it's actually fairly interesting. Depending on the task, there can sometimes be little bumps. In other words, after about five or six iterations, you actually often perform best, and then it gets worse again. Precision and recall? Or the Precision and recall. Okay. Likelihood always climbs. Right. I mean, the EM theorem guarantees that every step will climb the likelihood. And that, I mean, that's, that's still true, okay. right? <laughs> OK. so. In fact, my strategy here is going to be to say that maybe what we ought to do is try and look at simpler learning tasks which perhaps don't involve context and semantics quite as much. And so that's the reason why I'm looking at things like morphological segmentation and segmenting strings into words. Um, you know, so the idea is arguably that they are simpler. And if we can learn how to, uh, what, I wanna, what I actually am going to show is we can model these things in terms of very simple PCFGs. And if we can figure out how to learn those simple PCFGs for those simple tasks, maybe those techniques will carry over to more complex and more interesting tasks as well. And if we run into problems in learning to solve those simple tasks, then probably we shouldn't hope that the methods will generalize to the more complex ones without solving those simple problems. So here's a very simple problem, right? I mean, imagine that our training data is just a sequence of verbs, uh, you know, like talking and jump. Uh, I've, I've stuck end and beginning markers on either side. Um, uh, you'll actually see that appearing inside of the, uh, the, the analyses. Um, they're, they're really sort of just a technical device to uh, enable me to sort of monitor where the, where the string begins and ends. Um, and so here I'm imagining that the strings, I'm actually presented with strings that just simply contain a single verb. 
And the grammar that I want to learn is something like the following word goes to stem followed by suffix. There's this issue down here, stem goes to all possible stems. For now, what you can do is you can say, well, actually, maybe all possible stems consist of all prefixes of anything which is in the training data, and all, su all possible suffixes consist of all suffixes which might be in the training data. This is a little bit of a, of, of a kludge in here, right, because, of course, this training data is, in fact, not going to be the set of all possible verbs. It's going to be some subset of them. And, in fact, I think one of the neat things about these uh, non-parametric Bayesian methods is they actually give us a sort of like a more systematic way of dealing with this all possible stems and suffixes stuff. Okay, so the first thing to note is that even in this very simple little problem here, maximum likelihood goes wrong. And maximum likelihood, in fact, actually always chooses to pick no suffixes. So, and, and here's the reason. Basically, maximum likelihood always selects production probabilities which basically make the model match the probabilities in the training data as closely as possible. And the way to do that is to imagine that every possible form down here is a stem on its own with a null suffix. That's basically what's, what this is saying. In other words, this model generates the training data exactly. So we know we can do something about this. We know about Bayesian estimates and stuff like that. So uh, one way of doing that is to actually put a prior uh, over, over grammars. And uh, priors can be made sensitive to anything that you want to. And in fact, as far as I know, really nobody's started to systematically explore this stuff. We can have priors which are linguistically oriented. But we can also have priors which just simply say we prefer sparse solutions. In other words, we prefer, if we can analyze the data with fewer productions, with fewer rules, we should do that. And notice that's going to sort of drive us to trying to factor the data into terms of stems and suffixes rather than an analysis where every word is a stem on its own. So in particular, it turns out that if you use what are known as Dirichlet priors, and you have set the Dirichlet parameter alpha somewhere close to zero, that's in fact actually going to prefer a grammar where there's relatively few stem and relatively few suffixes. So I'm going to show you a little experiment where basically we're trained on orthographic verbs from uh, the Wall Street Journal corpus. The reason why I did that is because these things are part of speech tagged, and so I can actually, based on the part of speech and looking at the end of the word, I can make a reasonable bet as to what the true suffix is. So, if it's a VBG and it's got an ING at the end of it, then probably the ING is the true suffix. This gives me... So I prefer to work with phonemic forms, but I don't know an easy way of identifying the true suffixes with those things. And uh, if you want to know how one actually samples from such things, that would be a different sort of talk, but basically it's, it's a Gibbs sampler um, that you actually use to sample from the posterior distribution here. So... Let's just take a look at different values of alpha. So as alpha gets smaller, we prefer sparser and sparser solutions. So you can see as alpha is still fairly large, every verb is analyzed as a stem, which as we said is the maximum likelihood solution, so that's no surprise. As we start to make alpha smaller, you can see we're starting to pull off more suffixes, but even as alpha is getting really tiny, and in fact I actually think some, I showed this to some applied mathematicians and they said uh, you shouldn't believe uh, the solutions that you're getting with incredibly tiny alphas because basically the number of iterations you're going to need is on the order of 1 over alpha to converge and I certainly didn't run this thing for 10 to the 15 iterations but nonetheless you can see no matter how small I mark alpha it's pulling off some some suffixes, but it's actually not doing a terribly good job, right? I mean, you're still finding including as coming in as a stem on its own. And in fact, if we can, what we can actually do here is we can actually plot the posterior probability of various different sorts of models. So here what I've done is I've plotted the posterior probability of the model with null suffixes. That's the posterior, so that depends, that changes as I vary the Dirichlet parameter. Um, and so this red line is showing how the posterior probability is changing of the null suffix analysis as the Dirichlet prior parameter is being varied. Uh, I have a guess as to what the true suffixes are, which I got by actually, you know, as I said, looking at the parts of speech and making linguistically informed guesses as to what they are. That's what this green line is. And then this 
uh, blue line is obtained by calculation, where I've actually tried to I, I sample in order to find out what the posterior mode is, and then what I've done now is to compute the probability of that posterior mode. And what you actually notice is that the probability, the posterior probability of the true suffixes is nowhere close to the posterior mode probability. In other words, there's a gap of... And the y-axis is just a huge range. And the y-axis is a huge range. So what this says is there's no chance by sampling of getting these true suffixes. It's just not going to get it, right? So, so there's a huge gap in likelihood there. And what this is showing here is the correct solution is nowhere near as likely as the posterior, posterior mode, so the model is wrong. Now you should explain how many orders of magnitude is nowhere near. Well, so to be fair, however, this is over the entire corpus, so maybe we should divide that by the number of words in the corpus. Divide by a million or something? Yeah. It still is huge. It still is huge. I mean, in other words, if, if, if you were sort of hoping that just by random sampling, that you might find it, you would probably have to wait for, you know, like the order of the length of the universe or... Is that enough? Maybe not, right? <laughs> I mean, maybe not. So what's going on here? All right, what's wrong here? Even in this simple case, our methods aren't working. And we've even pulled out some Bayesian techniques and they're still not working. Well, I think the... At least one problem here is, you know, this is such a simple model, we should be able to find out what's wrong. And, one problem certainly is that the PCFG model has, is making an independence assumption. It's assuming that the probability of a suffix is independent of the stem, right? In other words, it's assuming the relative frequency of each suffix is the same for all stems. And if we just take a few verbs and plot basically the suffix down here versus the relative frequency, you can see that it's varying quite wildly. And these are all high frequency verbs, so these differences here are all highly significant. I mean, you know, if I plotted an error bar, it would be quite small relative to all of those things. So the PCFG independence assumption is nowhere close to being true. And so then it's no real surprise that the thing can't find a, a suffix ing because the relative frequency of those suffixes is varying dramatically from verb to verb, yet the PCFG the assumption is sort of said in linguistic terms of being productive. I mean, try level one or Latin. Oh, I, yes, yes. So, okay, so the, the one way of dealing with this, and I, I am a little afraid that this is throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but one way of dealing with this is in fact to actually do, uh, to try and sort of estimate the production probabilities from word types rather than tokens. So the idea is going to be that this is going to eliminate most of the frequency variation. So, for example, if you suppose that there were four common verb suffixes, if you were estimating them from verb types, then pretty much every verb is seen with each of these suffixes, maybe with different frequencies in terms of tokens, but in terms of types, the probability of seeing a suffix, you know, is going to be around 0.25. And in fact, for this sort of reason, a number of psycholinguists have actually claimed that children learn morphology from types rather than tokens. So one question is, and in fact, actually, if we do nothing other than just simply take our list of verbs and, you know, uh, make it into a list of verb types instead of a verb tokens and feed it into our, the same learner as we had before, now, in fact, it's actually sort of doing quite sensible stuff. I mean... There's the issue of pulling off the E here, but that's in fact actually, I think, largely because, um, you know, of uh, properties of, of English, um, English orthography, right? In fact, I think you could really think of the E as being a suffix, you know, uh, because to get the ING, you need to pull the E off. Uh, and you can see, so it's actually done a pretty good job, and it does a fairly good job of a several orders of magnitude. And if we plot the, the same sort of log posterior probabilities again, what we actually find is that the correct solution is actually very close to optimal uh, for a value of alpha at 10 to the minus third. Again, these two lines are sort of lining up on top of each other. And it's still not exactly optimal, but it's now much, much better than what it was before. Right? Okay, so I've just argued that in fact actually by sort of down-weighting frequency variation like this, that's one sort of component towards trying to get these PCFG learners to work better. But, I mean, in general, so that's 
this over dispersion, right? You know, one way of dealing with that is to do estimates from types rather than tokens. But in many cases, the types really aren't available. So, for example, speech doesn't come automatically segmented into words the way in which I was doing. But if I want to try and learn morphology from, from word tokens, I need to segment it beforehand. So, what I want to show you is a method essentially of sort of doing the segmentation uh, on the fly uh, using these Chinese restaurant process models. And the, the basic idea is going to be as follows, is that we're going to have a labeling distribution, which I'll write as P sub G, which generates the types. And, and this P sub G is just real, sort of kind of like responsible for generating the verb types. Then the Chinese restaurant process is, is going to be a process which essentially replicates types to produce tokens. And then the neat thing is that this labeling distribution uh, can in fact actually be estimated from the Chinese restaurant process. Then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some work that we've done trying to generalize this into what we call adapter grammars, it's sort of trying to make these Chinese restaurant processes sort of more grammar friendly, uh, incorporate them as a component inside of a grammar. Okay, so let me give you a bit of an idea of how a Chinese restaurant process works. The idea is you should think about, in terms of the Chinese restaurant analogy, you should think about uh, uh, basically uh, we've got a, a Chinese restaurant which is going to be responsible for um, uh, essentially sort of for, for analyzing words. So the, the word tokens are kind of like the customers which come into this restaurant. And uh, each one of these customers is going to be assigned to a table. And each table is going to correspond to a word type. And uh, the tables are going to have dishes or labels on them. And these labels are going to correspond to analyses of these word types. And in the Chinese restaurant anal uh, analogy, there's an infinite number of possible tables. And each table can hold an infinite number of possible customers. Um, so the general rule is sort of given down here. After, there's, after n customers are already in the restaurant and you've occupied m tables, you sit at a table proportional to the number of customers at it and uh, you wind up uh, where n sub k is the number of customers at table k and you sit at a new table uh, proportional to some probability alpha and then you go back to the labeling distribution and generate a new label. And so let me sort of show you how this all works in a little simulation. Right now the, the restaurant is empty, so by this rule here, the first customer actually has to sit at the first table. So the customer comes and sits at the first table. This table needs a label, needs something on it. So in fact, uh, we need to, we, we go back to our labeling distribution and it sort of generates a, uh, a, 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 an analysis at random, so it might generate the analysis you know, where the stem is jump and the suffix is ing, and the probability cost that we pay is the probability cost of generating that label. Okay, now when the second customer enters, can either choose this table with probability proportional to the number of customers on it, namely one, and can choose this table over here with probability alpha, uh, and so might well choose uh, to sit at this particular table, in which case we emit this same uh, analysis again, namely jumping. Um, now, when the third customer enters, uh, probability of picking the first table is proportional to the number of customers at it, namely two. Probability of picking the second table is proportional to alpha. So imagine that uh, the customer decides to sit at this table over here. In other words, this is the third token that we're generating. And then we also need to pay a probability cost of actually generating the analysis for that token. And so on like this. Okay, so at the very end of the day we've seated these five customers in here. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, is, uh, you know, if, if you just simply did this at random, the chance of something interesting coming out is sort of fairly small. In general, what happens is that you're going to have a fixed corpus and you're going to sort of systematically re-estimate this model by using Gibbs sampling, which essentially says reanalyze each word token given the analyses of the other word tokens. So uh, each word token in here is a customer 
and its table's label as the analysis that we're given to it. The GIP sampling step is to remove the token from its current uh, table, in other words, and deleting any empty tables, and choose a new table for the token, possibly, crea uh, possibly creating uh, a new table if necessary. What's interesting is that uh, the labeling distribution is going to be estimated by the label, sorry, yeah, by the labels on these tables here. So in particular, uh, if you look at these labels, even though jumping has been generated three times, there's a, it only labels one table, and so when we're doing our PCFG estimation, we'll in fact actually be estimating the, the, uh, the labeling distribution from one occurrence of jumping, right? So in other words, this is giving us a way of doing type-based inference, uh, even though we're generating token frequencies. Is that relatively clear? Okay, so now what I want to show is how this sort of process can be generalized uh, through what we call adapter grammars. This is probably the most complex part of the talk. So the idea is that an adapter grammar generalizes PCFGs by using, by essentially by associating uh, uh, these Chinese restaurant processes with a subset of the non-terminals in the grammar. So, if you sort of think of the way in which a PCFG works as saying, okay, to expand a non-terminal, pick a production uh, you know, that expands that non-terminal and then expand its children. Now what we're going to do is to say, okay, to expand a non-terminal, go into the restaurant associated with that non-terminal, and if you wind up sitting at an existing table, just simply produce the complete analysis for that non-terminal that comes from that table. Otherwise, and it's only in the case when you sit at a new table, do you wind up actually using the productions to generate those. So let's just go through this basically. So an adapter gram is just a PCFG with a parameter, uh, alpha sub A, for each non-terminal A. And this is just this Dirichlet prior that we saw before. If alpha sub A is greater than zero, then we're going to be running an adapter, running a, a Chinese restaurant process for A. So if alpha sub A is, is, uh, is equal to zero, Basically, that non-terminal expands as in a PCFG, whereas uh, if it's greater than zero, then we'll say it's adapted. And so basically what happens is that each, each time we need to come up with an expansion of A, we imagine that it's a customer entering A's restaurant. And if A sits at a new table, we actually generate a tree to label that new table as if A were not adapted. In other words, we go back to the productions and expand those. If A sits at an existing table, then we return the tree which labels that table. So I want to give you a bit of an example. This is an adapter grammar for the sort of morphology example that we saw before. So it's a little hard to sort of read, but basically it says that a word consists of a stem followed by a suffix, and stem expands to a sequence of, uh, uh, you know, the, the beginning marker followed by a sequence of characters, and characters is if you know how to write PCFGs, you know this is a, f a fairly standard way of writing a PCFG to generate a sequence. Basically, either chars consists of a single character that generates the sort of stopping condition, or it consists of a single character followed by another sequence of characters. So chars is going to generate character sequences of arbitrary lengths. And a stem consists of the start marker followed by some arbitrary number of characters, and the suffix consists just simply possibly of an end marker or a sequence of characters followed by an end marker. That's this sort of tree here. We're going to, now, you could just write a PCFG for this, but this PCFG would essentially wind up analyzing every word completely independently. What we're going to do instead is we're going to uh, write an adapter grammar for this, which basically means we're going to, we're going to say, OK, run Chinese restaurant processes at the word, the stem, and the suffix level. And what that means is that we're going to learn uh, a, seek, a, a set of strings which constitute the possible stems and the possible suffixes, and then also the possible words. Right. So let me show you sort of like a little simulation here. So if you think about this morpho, you think about these adapter grammars, these are sort of kind of like uh, uh, you know, Chinese restaurant alley where there's a whole sequence of Chinese restaurants, one for each non-terminal that's adapted. But they're sort of kind of funny Chinese restaurants. So uh, if we have to generate a, a new word, 
we send in the first customer and the first customer has to sit at a fresh table since there's no existing tables. Now we need to put a label on this table and there's nothing sitting on that table. So what we do is we, we you sort of can think of the productions associated with this non-terminal as being like a recipe. And this recipe says that in order to build a word, build a stem followed by a suffix. And I said this is a funny Chinese restaurant because in fact actually what you do, the way this Chinese restaurant builds a stem is it sort of orders out. So it says, oh, okay, I'm just going to go to the stem restaurant and I'm going to get something from the stem restaurant and I'm going to go to the suffix restaurant and get something from the suffix restaurant. So it sends out two other guys to those two restaurants. But the, they sit down, but their tables are empty as well, right? So the stem restaurant says, well, I need to generate a stem. I've got some rules here to generate a stem. I've got a recipe. And so it then goes off to the characters factory and basically the characters factory builds a new stem and builds a new suffix. Now we're not doing any Chinese restaurants associated with them. We just sort of generate them more or less at random. Okay, so now we've got labels here. These two guys now essentially sort of take some of the food that they've got here and they bring it back to the word restaurant that then assembles it back to form a new word. And that's the word we then generate. Yeah. Are yeah. those stem and suffix restaurants specific to the word or are they... There's just a single model for, for it. So there's single models, but the idea is going to be that they can be shared between multiple words. So the fact they can be shared between multiple words is going to mean essentially that you're going to see concentration on certain stems and on certain suffixes. Right? So if they weren't shared, then there would be no, there'd be no commonality between the stems. Right? Okay, so second customer comes in, maybe sets at a fresh table. Again, nothing labeling that table. So we order out, uh, which involves, again, by this recipe, involves going to the stem and the suffix restaurant. Uh, maybe we sit down at a fresh table at the stem restaurant, but sit down at an old table at the suffix restaurant, which means that we only need to generate a new label for the stem here, namely run. And so then we then come back and then generate runs because we've now taken the new stem combined with an old suffix. Yeah. It appears that the independence assumption is still in this model. Is that incorrect? The or independence the assumption is still at the labeling level, but not at the uh, but 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 not at the word level. In fact, I think maybe the very next step here. Yeah. In fact, that green step. Let me take that back. So the third guy comes in. The third guy may, in fact, actually just decide. Oh, okay. I'm just going to sit down at the first table. Right. And now you'll see, in fact, actually we haven't, there's no longer any independence assumption. We can now start to generate these words here, essentially with arbitrarily high frequency. But because we're not generating any fresh labels on the tables, we're not going to be changing our estimates of the relative probabilities of different stems or suffixes. Right? Does that make sense? So. So, so we are assuming essentially independence at the type level, but not at the token level. Okay, so again, fresh guy, send out, generate a new suffix, come back and then generate. So you can see basically we're reusing stems and reusing suffixes, but combining them in novel ways. And then because we're running a restaurant at the word level, the frequencies of individual words is in fact actually not predicted by the PCFG model, but in fact, actually, the Chinese restaurant process can replicate those words arbitrarily many times. Okay. All right, so uh, just a little idea about how one actually does estimation in this particular case. So in general, you've got a particular string, set of strings that you want to generate. Um, so you need to estimate both the table labels and the custom account for each table. And then actually, if you want to, you can also estimate the production probabilities from the, and because I know what those trees are that are labeling those things, so in fact, I can estimate my production probabilities from those. We've developed a sampling algorithm which does this. Um, uh, let me just say, one of the tricky things about it is that in fact, uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be a straightforward sampling algorithm for actually producing these conditional samples. Uh, and uh, 
So in fact, actually what we wind up doing is constructing a PCFG approximation and then we use a Metropolis Hastings correction factor. And just to give you a bit of an idea of what that PCFG approximation is, you, you can basically s imagine that in fact, well, what the PCFG approximation does is, as it adds additional productions to each of the adapted non-terminals, which correspond to the strings, you know, uh, the yields of all of these different trees here. And the probabilities are proportional to the number of guys sitting at that table. So for example, we're going to actually build a PCFG approximation uh, here, which uh, contains productions that say word goes to buys, word goes to runs, and word goes to buy, containing corresponding to these uh, sort of additional words which can be generated. And the probabilities will reflect the probabilities of sitting on these tables here. Um, and so, of course, you can see this PCFG approximation is going to change as the allocation of customers to tables change, which means that the PCFG needs to be computed on the fly. Okay, so if we do this type of thing, running restaurants for verbs, stems and suffixes, um, we do moderately well. I mean, basically, uh, uh, we wind up uh, segmenting 70% of the tokens correctly and 66% of the types. What I think is actually interesting is that many of the uh, errors are in fact actually uh, linguistically plausible. So to give you an idea of what I mean, um, many of the errors involve finding things like a suffix e in words like improve. Um, uh, this would also count as an error parsing have as there, but in fact actually if you sort of think about it, that's actually not such a bad analysis because that then lets you generate had and has following this. Um, Many of the other errors wind up looking at something like this, conforming, right, where it's decided. It, I mean, it, it's got no idea that con really isn't the stem and forming isn't a suffix. If we put priors, if we said that suffixes are usually shorter than stems, that might be a way of dealing with that. Should also say that, so, so the idea behind doing this type of thing is that if you want to build slightly more complex models, that it's fairly easy to do. And uh, those of you that are familiar with grammars can probably see how you could extend this fairly naturally to saying, well, maybe there's not just simply verbs in here, but there's actually several different word classes that have different classes of stems. That's what I mean by saying hidden word classes. And uh, so long as the languages have got little phonology, um, you can actually build sort of quite complex models of agglutinative languages. I, as those of you that know my wife, uh, she works on African languages, so I've built uh, uh, um, an unsupervised uh, learner of, of Bantu morphology that finds not just simply stems and suffixes, but actually segments words into about six different components. Okay, so now I want to turn to another application here, um, unigram word segmentation. And uh, so the idea behind a unigram model is we want to imagine that a string of words, something that looks like this, you want to see the book. This is a problem that Michael Brent uh, first of all worked on uh, about 10 years ago. Th th this is a corpus of child-directed speech where what Michael's done is he's uh, looked every word up in a uh, pronouncing dictionary and uh, then essentially removed the spaces between each of the phonemes, right? Um, so this is you want to see, yeah, you want to see the book. And so basically uh, a number of people have worked on trying to find uh, word segmentation models that are based on this. So we can in fact actually build a word segmentation model very easily uh, using an adapter grammar that basically says, okay, let's just generate a string of words. And again, this is just sort of the standard right recursive rule for generating a string of words. We, we run a single adapter for the word non-terminal, which says essentially memoize or cache words. Um, and if you do that, uh, you actually wind up, this is actually sort of a more typical output down here, right? You can see have, a uh, drink. And so it's got have and are uh, correctly segmented. And then drink, it's sort of decided that D is a word on its own. And rink is a word on its own as well. Um, and so if you use this type of model to do that stuff, you wind up getting about 54% uh, token accuracy, 59% uh, uh, type accuracy on word recognition, word segmentation. In, in fact, it's actually possible to combine these two models together. Um, so this is uh, 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 you know, an attempt where we say that a string of words consists 
of one or more words. Each word consists of a stem followed by a suffix and uh, we generate uh, stems and suffixes in terms of sequences of characters as we saw before. Uh, so the sort of analysis that we want to get out of this combined model looks roughly as follows, right? We say that an input like this is one uh, close it, right? So that's what the mother said to the kid. Um, and you can actually see this is an analysis which we found which is really not too bad, right? So one is analyzed as a stem, uh, is found as a suffix, close is found as a stem, and it is claimed to be a suffix. Well, that's not quite right, but you can see it's, you can see it's sort of getting this type of analysis in here. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, it really doesn't do a terribly good job of learning morphology. Uh, in fact, it's sort of fairly typical of the sort of analyses that it finds. This is, you can see down here, this is you have to tell me, right? And it's decided you have is a stem followed by a suffix. To tell is a stem, well, is it, is to is a stem, and tell me is a stem followed by a suffix, right? So in, in part what's going on here is actually this, this corpus doesn't really seem to contain an awful lot of English morphology. And so we've given it this ability to sort of say words consist of pairs and it's just decided that these are the best pairs that it can have. Does it do worse than just the word segmenter on word segmentation? Actually it does. I haven't evaluated it because I, but I think it does do worse. And in fact I think we can actually see a little bit here. I mean as I said one of the goals is to try and understand why these models sort of fail to work. What, one of the things that you actually find when you just simply run the unigram model that I was talking about is that, well, the unigram model basically assumes that, that words are really generated independently of context. But in fact, we actually know that there really are strong interword dependencies, collocations and things like that. And basically, in the face of collocations, the unigram model really has sort of kind of like a choice. It can either assume that the words are really generated independently of context or else it can sort of try to make a super word which contains multiple words. And so you actually find solutions that look like this. Take the doggy out. Right, that's what this is saying. But you can see the doggy is analyzed as a single word. And down here, you want to, right, that's three words collected together as a collocation. See the book. Right. Yeah. By varying alpha, wouldn't you be able to break them down? Yeah, you can. You can. And so in general, by varying alpha, you can force it to break down, but then it starts to pull apart individual words. And one of the problems with this stuff is that it can be hard to know, I mean, it can be hard to know if there is a decent value of alpha that gets the right solution. And, uh, you know, you can wind up also saying, well, maybe I'll have different alphas for stems and suffixes, and I, I can't claim to have explored that space thoroughly at all. But, you know, one thing that you can wind up doing is you can say, well, actually, we're not modeling this context here. Maybe we would, in fact, actually do better if we built a model that did try to model that context. Uh, and we already know roughly what those sorts of models look, ought to look like. These bigram models, which predict the next word based on the preceding word, uh, presumably the type of thing we should be trying to do. Um, so we can, in fact, actually build uh, a bigram model um, fairly straightforwardly here. In fact, one of the things that you can do is basically is sort of plug in a, a Chinese restaurant process wherever you wound up seeing a multinomial in the older model. Uh, so the basic idea is as follows. We're, we're going to say that each preceding word W, each context word W, is going to have its own distribution associated with it, which I'll call bigram of W which is responsible for predicting the following word. Now, the difficult thing here is that the set of possible words is actually unknown, you know, when we start off. We're, we're given an unsegmented corpus. So, in fact, the number of, of Chinese restaurant processes is also unknown. So we've got to construct Chinese restaurant processes on the fly. On the other hand, we want to have a common vocabulary that all of these bigram models share. Uh, so we're actually going to use another Chinese restaurant process 
to label, to generate the possible words. We'll call that model Unigram. So Unigram is a Chinese restaurant process that generates the common vocabulary for all bigrams. And let me give you an example of this here. So imagine now that we're going to start generating this sequence up here, just simply the book, the book. Here's the beginning of sentence markup. So the next word that we generate has got to be generated in the context of that beginning of sentence marker, which means that it's got to be generated in the bigram, you know, this, this beginning of sentence marker context here. So we come along and we say, okay, well, the first word we want to generate is the. That needs to label this table here, but all labels on this table need to be generated by the unigram model. So in fact, just as we saw before, basically this customer, you know, in order to produce a label for this table, we have to go back to the unigram model and, and generate the label for that table, namely generate the. And so presumably the unigram model itself generates uh, um, this, these labels here from a uniform distribution of the characters or something like that. Okay, all right. Now we're going to generate the next word that follows the. So that's got to be generated by the Chinese restaurant process associated with um, uh, down here, this the. So we generate a Chinese restaurant process corresponding to that. That word might be book, for example. Uh, so again, that has to be generated from the the restaurant. Uh, but because it's a fresh label, it needs to be generated by the Unigram model. Um, and then now, in the we need to generate the in the context of book, uh, and so we need to generate, but notice now we can share the common vocabulary in the unigram model. And then when we generate book now here, this book is now being generated in the same context as the, so now it's then shared in the bigram uh, uh, CRP for the. So this bigram segmentation model uh, is in fact actually implemented using Gibbs sampling. Uh, where the ith component of the sampler is really actually sampling is there a word boundary at, uh, between character i and character i plus one. And so sampling in fact actually amounts to possibly splitting a word at a fresh position or possibly joining two words which are but at that position. So in other words we're sort of continually sampling over these string positions, these boundary positions, and in effect then also sampling over the possible vocabulary. And it turns out that this model, in fact, does significantly better than the Unigram model. In fact, it does better than any other class of models on this particular data. So you can see it gets around three quarters of the words correctly segmented. Uh, one of the difficult things, however, is that the number of Chinese restaurant processes that we require in here is basically the number of words. But we don't know what the words are. Remember, we're actually sampling over the words themselves. So this actually means that we can't formulate this bigram model as an adapter grammar because the adapter grammars have a fixed number of Chinese restaurant processes. Basically, there's one Chinese restaurant process per non-terminal. So let me just sort of conclude here. So uh, at least answering sort of like, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to evaluate how far in advance this is towards the good old-fashioned AI goal of, of an unrestricted language learner but sort of addressing the more narrow question of what can these non-parametric Bayesian methods actually do for us here, right? I mean, what we've actually seen is that these Chinese restaurant process models give us a way of interpolating between types and tokens, even when the tokens themselves aren't actually given to us ahead of time. So that's kind of cool. I actually think the more interesting thing is that they're on a step towards sort of solving this problem of learning what the basic units of generalization are. So if you remember when I wrote out the PCFGs, I was saying, you know, stem expands to, and then in words, set of all possible stems. Well, the Chinese restaurant processes really actually give us a dynamic process which can generate stems and suffixes on the fly. These adapter grammars give us a way of expressing many different hierarchical CRP models. Uh, they come with a general purpose inference algorithm, and in fact, this code that I wrote where basically you give it a CRP and you give it a set of inputs and it will actually do the Gibbs sampling that I was telling you about. Um, and these adapter grammar models can in fact actually be used to model other tasks as well. So hierarchical clustering is something that 
they can be used to do, for example. Uh, but this is still very much a work in progress. So one technical question that I'm interested in is, is, is there some generalization of adapter grammars that includes the notion of bigram word segmentation as well? I, I think the sort of contextual dependencies that we saw improved word segmentation, right? Being able to go to some sort of bigram model is going to be, again, I think this is going to be a problem which is going to come up again and again in grammar induction. And so it would be nice to have a way of expressing such contextual dependencies within sort of kind of like a common framework rather than having to build custom models and custom samplers for each different model. Um, in terms of practical problems, um, it's very difficult to know how to choose the right prize to get the right behavior. This is what someone was asking about. I mean, there's, as the models get more complicated, there's more and more adjustable parameters and it's very hard to tell whether any combination of them actually does anything sensible. And uh, as the grammars get more complex and the data sets get larger, the Gibbs sampler also seems to get slower. So in fact, I actually think finding more efficient estimation techniques is also an interesting problem. So thanks, guys. Thanks for sitting through all of this. I think. <laughs>